Thanks so much for watching Hims TV. I'm Kat Jersich, Senior Editor at Healthcare IT News, here with George Halverson, former CEO of Kaiser Permanente, who is now the chair of the Institute for Intergroup Understanding. Can you start by speaking a little bit about the mission and the vision of the Institute? The Institute um, is based on the assumption that we are all creatures of instincts, that we are instinctively territorial, hierarchical, uh, maternal, paternal, and that we have very strong instincts to divide the world into us and them. And if somebody is an us, we're protective, supportive, understanding, forgiving. If somebody's a them, we're territorial, antagonistic. Uh, we tend to dislike them. We tend to uh, try to hurt them. We damage them. And we do some fairly ugly things and even suspend conscience when we perceive someone to be a them. So it's obviously better to have a sense of being us and it's somewhat dangerous to have a sense of being them. And so we're working on as an institute teaching people what those instincts are and then teaching people how to use them, channel them, and uh, focus them in positive directions rather than negative directions. So our, our goal as an institute is to deal with issues of, of intergroup understanding. And right now as a country, we are uh, somewhat cursed by uh, having some fairly tribal behaviors dividing the country and us and them. And when that happens, we become angry, uh, extremely judgmental, uh, we, we tend to um, do things that um, are damaging to them. And, um, and because of that, we even suspend conscience and um, suspend guilt. And so what we need to do as a country is get through this. We've got to get past these really terrible times that we could be facing. And then one of the things we teach at the Institute is right now in the world, there are 200 countries that are having internal fighting at the SNM level. Ethnic conflicts in over 200 places. And in those places, people are killing each other, expelling each other, uh, damaging each other at, at major levels. And so those behaviors are human behaviors. They happen to us in, in a setting where they're activated. And so in this country, we need to get past that. And in this country, we've done it for years on racial issues. And we have done a lot of, of uh, us them thinking relative to race. And we are um, at a point now where I think we could be on the cusp of a golden age in that area because I think we're beginning to understand across all groups how much damage racism has done to us. Mm. And we're beginning to have a, a bigger, a better understanding. I actually think as a country, um, I'm optimistic because the, the Me Too movement made a huge difference on women's issues. It was unexpected, very surprising, but suddenly we ended up on a whole wide range of women's issues becoming much, much, much more enlightened and uh, responsible, actually. And I think we have the potential to go in the same direction now on racism. Mm. And Isabel Wilkinson's new book, uh, Cast, amazing book, stunning book, explains some of the reasons why we have so much anger in this country at the racial level. And that's what we're trying to do with the Institute is help people understand our past on, on both of those agendas. We need to become saints. We all have the ability to be saints. We all have the ability to be sinners. Um, we need to capitalize and build on the saint side of our personalities. And if we do that, and if we do it in real ways, we can actually make it stick. Um, the organizations that I have led, um, we have looked at us them issues and have built on the um, ability to become an us. So at Kaiser Permanente, we had, um, the day I left, we were 59% minority. Mm -hmm. uh, we had eight regional presidents and only 
two of them were white males. Uh, we were number one on J.D. Powers, number one in Consumer Reports, number one on all of the performance standards because our diversity gave us great strength and let us hire some really good people and, and put us down some good paths. And diversity is a strength if you do it well. But if you do it badly, then people fight with each other, don't get along, don't trust each other, and it can be very divisive. So at, at KP, we basically turned our diversity into a strength. And at KP, we also computerized everything. So we spent $4 billion computerizing our entire shop. So the, the day I left, there was no paper at KP. The, the medical records were electronic. The imaging was electronic. The billing was electronic. Everything we did was electronic and connected and everything was connected with itself. And because of that, um, on something like NCQ, he scores, it was much, much easier to get things right because we had that toolkit in place. What we're trying to do is create a sense of us for America and help people become enlightened mm. about those topics and those issues. Given the fact that Kaiser was relying on an entirely digital framework, that leads me to my next question, actually, which is how can digital health innovators ensure that the tools that they're creating and that the framework they're moving toward doesn't accidentally exacerbate the existing gaps, gaps that we see uh, in healthcare. For example, at Health Virtual, we heard from people who noted that telehealth, while it can be extremely important in terms of getting care to vulnerable people, can also be leaving them behind, whether it's because of broadband, whether it's because of digital literacy. So what are some of the important things for innovators to keep in mind to make sure that these tools and that their digital innovations are including the people who are currently being left behind and who could benefit the most? Well, that's uh, two parts. First thing is at, at Kaiser, we actually kept track of race and ethnicity in our patients. Hmm. So we, as we put people into the electronic medical record, we actually tracked how well we did on something like cancer detection, uh, diabetes follow-up, and by race, ethnicity, age, sex. Um, and that data was extremely, extremely useful because we discovered at Kaiser we had, um, on something like diabetes, we had significant differences between groups of people in the San Diego market, for example, or in Honolulu, based on which group people were in. And then when we got that data, it had been, people had been suspecting that for years, but we actually proved it when we had the data. And then when we figured it out, we sat down and figured it out and said, why in San Diego is the death rate for prostate cancer so much higher for Hispanic men? And looked back at, discovered that it, as an example, the Hispanic men were not likely to come in and have the prostate exam done mm. until very, very late in the process. So when we knew that, we then started saying to the doctors who had Hispanic male patients, uh, these guys are not likely to have their prostate checked. Uh, you might want to promote that as part of the exam. And we actually, over three years, got the death rate down for the Hispanic men to the same level as the non-Hispanic men by just focusing on that issue and making a difference in that space. And so we discovered that we could do the whole series of things we did and inside KP, uh, that's a good direction to go. And to your point a minute ago, if, if you're a low income person, you don't have any computer access. If your care site isn't uh, accessible, then we can see some disparities in health going forward that are based on race and ethnicity unintentionally. They're not directly race and ethnicity, but they are uh, the result of the unintended consequences of some of the earning gaps, mm -hmm. as well as the learning gaps that happen for those groups. So we, we need to make sure as we can become much, much better at electronic care that we provide access to that care to everyone from every group. I've heard from some folks, to your point about uh, data surveillance, that it's not just about having enough data, it's compelling systems to take action with that data. So yes. how, how can those in power be compelled 
to use that data to do what you were saying and for example connect it to the social determinants of health that are maybe causing those discrepancies what might be an appropriate incentive for people to take action based on that data i've heard for example that many people think that there's quite enough information being collected but the question is how to take action with that information well first of all we need to report it hmm. We need to understand that when, inside KP, we couldn't take action on anything until we knew that there was a difference in the prostate death rate, um, prostate cancer death rate. Once we knew it, then we could think about it and take a look at it and then say, okay, why could this be happening and what could we do about it? So in every setting, we need not only to gather the data, but to report the data, to look at the data, and then we need to have smart people look at the differences that we see and then make a decision site by site what to do about it. And this is one of those areas where the human body tends to be the same from site to site. So if we discover that something is true in San Diego or Honolulu, it's highly likely to be true in Washington, DC or pick your town, New York City. And so what that means is once we learn things, we need to get the information out and we need to share information more broadly. And one of the big gaps we have right now in medical information is that it doesn't get shared very quickly. And COVID is actually really helping in that area. There's some major breakthroughs going on with COVID. One, one of the breakthroughs is that everyone is getting connected data now. We are all getting e-visits. Um, the, the government's allowing e-visits, the payers are supporting e-visits. E-visits are happening. People love e-visits. People really like it when they can connect electronically with the doctor and don't have to drive to the office. So we've, we've got the e-visit phenomenon happening. But the other thing that's happening that we didn't expect is all of a sudden we have multiple venues. COVID Coalition is one. Uh, Epic's new uh, data sharing is another. We have multiple venues where we are doing real-time rapid learning, sharing of information among caregivers mm. about patterns of care, approaches to care, and care information. And that's really important. That's a major breakthrough because the old model was you'd learn something, then you'd publish it. The publishing process takes a year because you have to go through referee journals and you go through time frame. And then when it's published, it's distributed in very slow um, and inaccessible vehicles much of the time. So back to KP, we had every medical record, every journal, every textbook available to the doctors all the time. But other places don't have that. And so most doctors don't have um, access to the new science and there's no vehicles for sharing it. Now there are COVID coalition is sharing data about COVID, uh, diagnosis data, treatment data, follow-up data. Uh, when they were looking at masks, which masks were working, which masks were available. That data didn't go through referee journals and in two years of review, it, it was shared immediately. Mm -hmm. Epic has, I, I think uh, Judy Faulkner's talking about having a thousand uh, people sharing through that system and you know, what they're sharing is the most current information that they have on all of those topics. And what you have to do as an observer of that is make your own decision based on who is offering the information and whether or not you, you think this is credible. But if the Cleveland Clinic is offering information about some aspect of COVID and heart disease, um, it's highly likely that that's a good and valid piece of information. So that's a good thing. There, there's a data sharing in a in kind of a both camaraderie and a, and a collaboration that's happening now that didn't happen before COVID. And I don't think anyone's gonna be willing to go back to the old model. Mm -hmm. I think now that we have learned to do e-visits, it's gonna be really hard to get people to give up e-visits now that we are doing uh, that kind of sharing and that kind of, of rapid turnaround. I think it'll be hard to give it up. And I, and I think we're on, on the cusp of a world where artificial intelligence is beginning to do work, uh, particularly the diagnostic area. 
where we can get relatively little information from a number of sources and do some diagnostic work that um, couldn't have been done before because without the algorithms, we didn't even suspect some of the correlations and, and, and now we can look at them. But once they're done, once that new training in, in learning is out there, they can be used by everybody. This is the kind of thing where, they're, again, I think there's going to be a sharing process going on. And once you get the new algorithm for looking at Fitbit data and the likelihood of having a heart attack, um, all of a sudden that the world is going to want that and start using it. And many, many, many people are wearing Fitbits and the equivalent. And so I think we are actually on the cusp of a golden age of care improvement as well that's going to be um, anchored in that whole um, artificial intelligence and data sharing world. What do you see as some of the most vital policy priorities for the next administration, regardless of who ends up winning? I think we need to sit down right after the election. Right now, COVID is still highly political. Um, we need it to be highly scientific. Mm. So what we need to do is right after the election, we need to sit down and figure out what's really happening, what really works, what are the best practices, um, what are the right things that we can do for patients, and then share that information, and make that a priority. And, and as we look at the issue, um, vaccines can have a positive impact. But an even higher um, value impact would be if we could figure out and maybe artificial intelligence algorithms help with that as each patient gets COVID for that particular patient, given their characteristics, their comorbidities, their physical attributes, what is the right immediate treatment mm. to give that person? And if you figure out the right immediate treatment, how do you get that treatment to that person immediately? And if the death rate goes down to 2%, then uh, we don't even need the vaccine at 60%. Um, what we need is the 2% uh, solution. And I think it's possible we can get there. We're not there yet, but we are, we've got some really good people doing some really good work. Thank you so much again.